Paryatti Audio Books presents Gautama the Buddha's Son of Earth Chapter 3 To gain wisdom your own experience shows the way not the tradition Written by A.H. Sadunke translated by Dhananjay Chavan and narrated by Parag Sampath Chapter 3 To gain wisdom your own experience shows the way not the tradition the tathagata assured us that every person in the world has the capacity to attain bodhi he exhorted us to make efforts to use this capacity he discussed epistemological issues in simple and lucid language instead of using complicated and obtuse terms but this doesn't mean that his was a lesser philosophy on the contrary it is a historical fact that such original thought which removed all artificial shackles from human mind and set it free was very rare in ancient times it was out of compassion for the common people that he used simple lucid and understandable language we have seen earlier how through various experiments through immense difficulties using his sharp intelligence and perfecting his personality siddhartha gautama attained bodhi and became a buddha in this chapter we will look at him from an epistemological perspective the buddha said he saw only for that which was actually seen his constant emphasis that one should not form an opinion hurriedly and impatiently without adequate basis placed the process of acquisition of knowledge on a superior ethical and scientific foundation it also created harmonious communication and was beneficial to all here is the gist of the discourse from the middle discourses that he gave while he was dwelling in jaitvana of savathi if a bhikkhu claims that he has done what had to be done that is achieved his goal and has become an arhat don't accept or reject his claim ask him about the four aspects and see if he is endowed with the fourfold conduct described by the tathagata one to say have seen for what he has actually seen two to say have heard for what he has actually heard three to say remembered for what he has actually remembered four to say understood for what he has actually understood if you find this fourfold conduct in the bhikkhu who claims to have achieved his goal you can assume that he has been liberated from all taints in regards to these conducts and you should accept his attainment the tests that the buddha gave to confirm the reality of knowledge are important from philosophical and epistemological perspective especially the source of knowledge These tests can be used by an ordinary person to avoid arguments and to live a happy life. Say that you have seen something only if you have really seen it with your own eyes. Don't say I have seen it when you have only heard about it. Say that you have heard it. If you are saying something based on your memory, say so. Don't say that you say so based on your understanding. one who knows these boundaries in the field of knowledge becomes more honest and straightforward more tolerant and humble more importantly he disentangles himself from the traps of ignorance and gets closer to real knowledge the buddha said ignorance is the root of downfall the buddha told the bhikkhus repeatedly that nescience is responsible for various painful things and wisdom is beneficial in various ways here is a summary of the discourse on learning vijja sutta in iti vitukka of the mixed discourses khuddak nikaya ignorance is responsible for unwholesome and distressing things it makes one shameless it makes one irresponsible here or hereafter defeats caused due to craving and greed have their root in ignorance one who is immoral shameless and impudent commits immoral acts 
which leads to his downfall. Therefore, remove craving, greed and ignorance. Gain wisdom and avoid downfall. In the very next sutta of Itivatukka, the Buddha tells the bhikkhus that lack of wisdom makes one suffer in this world and afterwards too. Those who cultivate wisdom become happy here and hereafter. He taught the Dhamma to the people who believe in life after death and those who didn't. Gain or loss of wisdom is the biggest gain and the biggest loss. The Tathagata once said, To lose near and dear ones is a small loss, but the loss of wisdom is a big loss. To increase the number of near and dear ones is a small gain. To cultivate wisdom is the big gain. Therefore, because you should vow to grow by cultivating wisdom. He made similar observations about material luxuries and about prestige. Loss of material comforts or prestige is a minor loss. Loss of wisdom is a major loss. Getting more material comforts or fame is a minor gain. Getting more wisdom is a major gain. To become an arahant, to become liberated, wisdom is needed, along with morality and concentration. What is wisdom? Panya. It is the highest and the best state of fully developed understanding. The Buddha explained in various ways how to cultivate wisdom how to gain knowledge, how to use intellect and how to preserve our freedom. The Tathagata was analytical. He would not make extreme comments based on insufficient information. He thought that casually forming and expressing a definitive opinion without taking into consideration all aspects is not right. He was a Vibhajavadin literally one who analyzes all aspects of situation and didn't look at just one aspect. He followed the scientific doctrine of using reason and analysis to develop insight. Here is an instance from numerical discourses. Once while the Buddha was dwelling in Jaitvana in Savati, Sariputta was approached by two bhikkhus, Samiddha and Mahakothikka. Sariputta told them there were three kinds of meditators, liberated by conduct, liberated by understanding, and liberated by faith. The three debated which one is superior. Each one deferred and put forth his own point of view. Sariputta suggested that they seek the Buddha's opinion. Then the three of them went to the Buddha. When Sariputta briefed him about their debate, the Buddha commented, Sariputta, who among these is superior and who has progressed more cannot be decided by looking at just one aspect. He then explained that depending on how one looks at it, different persons would be seen as having progressed more. The above-mentioned principles of the Buddha's teaching highlight how the Tathagata took a revolutionary stand for his time in the field of knowledge. We find it in Kesamutti Sutta of the Numerical Discourses. Once while travelling in Kosala, the Tathagata was dwelling in the Kalamas town named Kesamuttu, along with a large retinue of bhikkhus. When the Kalamas learned about his visit, they came to meet him. After suitable salutations, they sat on one side and said, Venerable Sir, many ascetics and holy men come to Kesamutta. They expound their teachings and commend it. Also, they criticize the teachings of others, disrespect it and claim they are inferior. Other ascetics and holy men come and do the same, praising their teaching and condemning those of others. We become skeptical as to who among them speaks the truth and who is lying. The Buddha assured them, Kalamas, you are right in being sceptical. Doubt has arisen in your mind about what which should raise doubt. Kalamas, do not accept anything based only on what you have heard. Do not accept anything based on tradition. Do not accept anything because someone says so. 
do not accept anything merely because it is in the scriptures do not accept anything simply based on surmise logic not backed by experience or axiom nyaya do not accept anything based on external appearances do not accept anything based on speculation because it is in keeping with your beliefs and inclinations do not accept anything because of the personality of the one who is saying it or because it is a possibility do not accept anything because the one who is proclaiming it is your teacher kalamas when after thorough investigation and reflection based on your personal experience you find that these things are unwholesome deficient censored by the wise people and when accepted cause suffering and harm then kalamas you should reject them then the buddha asked them whether craving aversion and ignorance are beneficial or harmful the kalamas responded by saying harmful venerable sir he repeated these instructions second and the third time then he advised them kalamas when after thorough investigation and reflection with reason based on your personal experience you find that these things are wholesome are blameless are praised by the wise people and when accepted are beneficial and conducive to happiness then kalamas you should not just only accept them but also follow them in your life then the buddha asked them whether non craving non aversion and non ignorance are beneficial or harmful the kalamas responded by saying beneficial venerable sir bhikkhu bodhi among the foremost buddhist scholars of our time warns us that this discourse is not intended as an endorsement for either radical skepticism or for the creation of unreasonable personal truth as it is clear from the above description the buddha argued that the three unwholesome roots of craving aversion and ignorance should be abandoned whether there is life after death or not ethical conduct does help at the end of his discourse to the kalamas the buddha told them that a noble disciple who abandons defilements and unwholesome states of mind and cultivates goodwill compassion sympathetic joy among other wholesome states is assured four things one if indeed there is life after death and fruit of sinful and wholesome actions then he will go to heaven two if there is no life after death and no fruit of sinful and wholesome actions then in this very world and in this very body having abandoned enmity anger and misery he will live a happy and peaceful life 3 if the thought of harming others does harm others then by not having such hateful thoughts he remains untouched by suffering 4 if the thought of harming others does not harm others even then he remains unsullied in both ways by not having hateful thoughts and seeing that the others are not harmed all the doubts of the kalamas were dispelled by this discourse and they were fully satisfied 25 centuries ago the buddha explained the importance of one's own experience in the field of knowledge by saying that no matter how revered the person of the scripture one should not accept it merely out of devotion or reverence he put forth a view that truly liberated human intellect and allowed human creativity to blossom the word that he uses to describe scriptures is pitak he didn't say don't believe in the vedas or other traditions he brings his own dhamma also in the ambit of inquiry by saying don't believe it blindly he doesn't point a finger merely at teachers of other traditions and make them an object of investigation it is noteworthy that he says don't blindly believe the teachers of ascetics that is sammana teachers so as to leave no doubt whatsoever he put himself in the sphere of inquiry with these candid words 
Unfortunately, we embrace manusmriti that bans scrutiny of religions. On one hand, the Buddha destroyed all the obstacles that came in the way of advancement of human mind to the extent that he took care that even his personality or dhamma doesn't become a hindrance in freedom of thought. On the other hand, Manusmriti, an influential religious scripture written about 400 years after the Buddha, considered examination of religion sacrilege. Though Brahmanical, it said that Brahmins too should be punished if they decide to scrutinize the scriptures. This rule of Manusmriti is a significant reason for the decline of Indian society. It is the misfortune of Indian society that in spite of the munificent teaching of the Buddha, many Indians in the later centuries decided to follow the dark path of Manusmriti. While Pola Rahula says, The freedom of thought allowed by the Buddha is unheard of elsewhere in the history of religions. Renowned scholar monk Venerable Anand Kausalyayan wrote in the preface of his translation of the numerical discourses Anguttara Nikaya, Kalama Sutta is so momentous that not only in Buddhist literature but also in all literature of the world it has come to be mankind's charter for freedom of thought. Later while talking about his life he notes with gratitude the author is especially grateful to this Kalama Sutta because 35 years ago this was the discourse of the Buddha that played a significant role in my taking refuge in the triple gem, the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. The Tathagata didn't just make a theoretical principle of his exhortation, he also taught with example the practical application of the principle. He said that even a Buddha's qualities should be confirmed by proper scrutiny. Vimamsaka Sutta of Middle Discourses is a veritable lighthouse in the field of religious epistemology. Once while he was dwelling in Anathapindika's monastery in Jaitvana, he called bhikkhus and addressed them thus, Bhikkhus, a bhikkhu who has the capacity to know the mind of another, should examine whether the Tathagata is a Sambuddha. The bhikkhus asked him to clarify what he meant. The Buddha explained, the bhikkhu responsible for examining the Buddha should do so in two aspects, what can be seen with eyes and what can be heard with ears. He should confirm that such unwholesome qualities that can be seen by eyes and heard by ears are not present in the Buddha. The bhikkhu should also confirm that mixed states are not present in the Buddha. Then the bhikkhu should further examine the Buddha and confirm that pure, untainted states are present in him and whether these pure states are present in him always or only for short period of time. Then the bhikkhu should investigate whether, on acquiring name and fame, taints have arisen in the Buddha. Then he should check whether he is fearless and yet restrained, or he is restrained on account of fear. Then the bhikkhu should examine whether the Buddha doesn't indulge in sensual pleasures because he is lust-free on account of having destroyed craving. Thus having examined the Tathagata, the bhikkhu would explain these qualities to others. Then others should question that bhikkhu on what ground did he base his observations and the bhikkhu should explain in detail and should declare whether the Tathagata is dwelling in the community or dwelling alone, while others are well behaved or not well behaved, where some teach in congregations, where some are entangled in worldly enticements and some are untainted by worldly things. He does not despise any of them on that account, neither when he is with the Sangha nor when he is alone. Then the Tathagata advised the bhikkhus. Then bhikkhus should ask the Tathagata himself whether such defiled states as can be seen by eyes and heard by ears are present in him or not. Having confirmed that he has no defiled states and mixed states, he should be asked whether he has pure states. 
if he confirms that he follows the pure states, experiences the pure states, and is endowed with these pure qualities, one should go to learn the Dhamma from him. On going to such a teacher, as the disciple progresses, the teacher teaches him higher and higher Dhamma, ever more sublime, explaining differentiation of dark and bright things. As the disciple experiences those higher and higher more sublime states, through direct knowledge and finding fulfillment, he develops confidence in the teaching. He develops faith in the Tathagata thus. The Buddha is fully self-enlightened. His Dhamma is well explained and the Sangha walks on the right path. This bhikkhu, when asked by others about the Tathagata, is able to articulate his experiences well. The Buddha explained that faith developed after scrutiny is steadfast. Having thus given a sermon on how to investigate him, the Tathagata added, Bhikkhus, whose faith is certain, well-rooted, established, in this manner, and with these phrases and words, this is called faith well established, rooted in vision, immovable. It is unshaken by an ascetic or holy man or deity or Mara or Brahma or by anyone in the world. This is how Bhikkhus, the Tathagata, is investigated rightly and thus is the Dhamma in him well investigated. The word Tathagata is unbreakably connected to the actual state of things, the reality of objects, to the truth. The discourse about tells us how meaningfully this word is used for Gautama the Buddha. While seeking truth and knowing reality, great men too must and highlight ego and prestige to become humble. Of this, the Tathagata presented an excellent ideal for the society through his own behavior. A seeker of truth has to clear the cobwebs of conventional thoughts and undertake a free inquiry. Often, at such times, the prestige of man and society becomes a defensive cover for him and then it doesn't allow his personality to be touched by any investigation. The Tathagata pushed aside this phenomenon deliberately and forcefully. He created an independent mindset in these bhikkhus by asking them to investigate the thoughts and conduct of the Tathagata. He underscored the principle that no man is greater than truth. Needless to say, in doing so, he encouraged the bhikkhus to rationally investigate others as well. Dr. Ambedkar emphasized this in his book, The Buddha and His Dhamma. He wrote, Principle must live by itself and not by authority of man. If principle needs the authority of man, it is no principle. If every time it becomes necessary to invoke the name of the founder to enforce the authority of Dhamma, then it is no Dhamma. The Buddha instructed the bhikkhus to examine whether the Tathagata had any defilements. He also told them to check for mixed states as sometimes negative qualities overshadow positive ones and adversely affect character. He didn't stop by instructing them to check for absence of negative qualities but also told them to confirm the presence of positive qualities, pure states in the Tathagata. He also instructed the bhikkhus to check whether pure states, positive qualities, existed for a long time or whether they were temporary. This is important to note in spiritual field. Sometimes, a clever man puts a good show in front of people and presents a facade of goodness. However, in actual life, it is not a constant quality in him and it is not an integral part of his conduct. This pretense of goodness is done as a convenience for prestige or to gain something. Therefore, the investigator must be able to look beyond mere appearances. An episode narrated in the numerical discourses is particularly noteworthy here. Once the Tathagata was dwelling in Deer Park at Isipatan, some elders were conferring. A young bhikkhu named Chitta kept interfering in the discussion. 
Then the elder Maha Kothikka requested him not to interfere and to say whatever he had to say after the discussion was over. Chitta's friend didn't agree with the elder's request. He was then given this important advice. Some people are humble, restrained and quiet as long as they are with the Buddha or with somebody they revere. After they go away from the revered person, they do not remain restrained. We cannot say that the bull which is confined to its pen or tied down with a rope doesn't eat crops. Because if it is let loose, it will probably eat the crop. Similarly, some people were very humble in front of the Buddha. Investigation of the Tathagata should not be cursory. It should be thoughtful and thorough. The Tathagata had experienced human behavior in all its subtle forms, as it is clear from the Sermon above. We will now discuss further how to evaluate a profane mind with free inquiry. Defilements will enter an unguarded, impure mind. Another facet of investigation that the Buddha highlighted is also very important. As long as someone is not famous and has no special prestige in society, one is humble and cooperative. But as soon as one becomes successful and famous, one starts to become rude, careless and arrogant. One's behavior becomes irresponsible and disdainful. This happens with many people and therefore this aspect should also be carefully seen while judging a person. It is necessary to see whether the person has carefully preserved his good qualities even after getting name and fame. Fear should not be the cause behind good conduct. If someone behaves properly out of fear, then it cannot be said to be commendable. If someone behaves in a noble manner because of one's principles, because it has become one's nature, when there is no outer pressure, no threat or enticement of some worldly or sensual pleasure, then one is really endowed with good conduct. This is another aspect that Buddha highlighted. Criticizing others in private is a sign of a tainted mind. Castigating others is a favorite pastime of some. Some say one thing in public and in private life behave contrary to their professed views. Therefore, if someone has good words for others in public and in private too displays no ill will or antipathy, then that person passes the test laid down by the Tathagata. There is one more important tip for the investigator. One who claims to be a Tathagata should solemnly affirm that he has no defiled states. This solemn affirmation is important. Even in modern times, many things are formalized by taking an oath. An oath works in two ways. On one hand, while taking an oath, one realizes again the burden of responsibility. On other hand, people too keep an eye on him or her in view of the oath. Thus the investigator, having judged the teacher in various ways, should go to him for training in Dhamma. He should then follow step by step all the guidance of the teacher for one's own liberation. After discussing about investigating the Dhamma and the teacher, let us understand the importance of faith. Faith is a flower of honesty on the peduncle of investigation. Towards the end of Vimamsaka Sutta, the Tathagata makes a vital point. Often in his discourses, he emphasizes faith, Sadda. In religious traditions, we can see that faith often makes the intellect blunt curtails freedom and obstructs man's progress. Therefore, many may ask the question as how to examine the faith so often praised by the Buddha. The Tathagata gives a clear answer about this. Faith praised by the Tathagata is not blind faith. His faith is confidence one has in the truth and is confirmed by strict investigation. Thus, Faith is the fragrant flower of truthfulness that blossoms on the basis of investigation. 
the faith should not be baseless or merely customary but rooted in the path of self experience in sangharava sutta of middle discourses we see some more aspects of the tathagata's view on knowledge once the buddha was dwelling in kosala a brahmin woman named dhananjani developed faith in the buddha dhamma and sangha once she was heard uttering the praise of the buddha salutations to the blessed one liberated one perfectly enlightened one at that time in that town lived a brahmin named sangharava who had studied the three vedas on hearing dhananjani's utterance he said woe to dhananjani who is praising the shaven headed samana instead of the brahmins dhananjani informed him about the buddha she said you don't know the tathagata's virtues and his wisdom if you come to know them you will feel that it is not proper to abuse or censure him then he asked her to let him know when the tathagata arrives in town later when the tathagata arrived in town dhananjani informed sangarava who then went to meet the buddha sangarava asked the buddha there are some ascetics and holy men who claim to teach the essence of the righteous life after having reached the consummation and perfection of direct knowledge here and now where among them do you stand the buddha said ascetics and holy men are of three types firstly there are traditionalists who like the brahmins of three vedas claim to teach on the basis of oral tradition secondly there are some who speculate and investigate not properly but in ways that support their own faith finally some eschew tradition and discover dhamma with their own experience with their own efforts i belong on the third category among the three categories enumerated by the buddha the first takes scriptures as the source of knowledge this group considers that only traditional scriptures such as the vedas are the pure and ultimate truth the second group bases its analysis and inferences only data that supports their faith the third group to which the tathagata belongs gives primacy to one's own experience based on sound investigation objective observation and rational analysis in an episode in his epic buddha charita ashwa gosha presents the tathagata's view about developing wisdom after siddhartha left home and took robes suddhodana sent a priest and a minister to convince him to return home the minister argued that there have been others in the past who were successful in high spiritual attainments while staying in the palace instead of staying in the jungle siddhartha's response is significant in the field of spiritual endeavor he said i do not form an opinion based on what other people say in the matters that confuse the world such as whether something exists or something doesn't exist i strive to know the reality and to come to a conclusion it is not right for me to accept any view that arises out of doubt which is unclear and contradictory wise men that follow another's experience parapratyaya without due thought is like a blind following a blind in darkness one shouldn't accept someone else's views completely unquestioningly and blindly one should use logic and clarify those with one's own experience ashwagosha has put the buddha's view properly the tathagata felt that one should not accept something merely based on tradition merely because it is accepted by one sect or merely because a famous scholar has proposed it many scholars have opined that the great poet kalidas was influenced by ashwagosha the view put forth by him above has been accepted by kalidas along with the word parapratyaya someone else's experience and has been put forth in the field of poetry in his play mala vikagni mitra he writes in a verse all that is old is gold and new poetry is bad is not true discerning people examine both and accept one 
An idiot, on the other hand, uses parapratyaya, another's experience, to form his opinion. It is not surprising that Sangharava became angry and started censuring Dhananjani because she saluted the Buddha. It was a deep-rooted belief in the mind of many that only Brahmins, even unwise ones, are worthy of salutations and others, however wise and erudite, are not. Shaven-headed and Sammanaka are pejorative form of Sammana, ascetic, were used with disdain by Sangharava. He does meet the Tathagata, but not out of curiosity and not with humility, but with a desire to defeat and revile him. It is important to understand that truth is protected by humility, not by obstinacy. Once the Tathagata was dwelling in Sala woods named God's Grove to the north of the town Upasada, Pasenadi had given the town as a gift to a Brahmin named Chunky. When the Brahmins in the town came to know that the Buddha was staying nearby, they went to meet him. Chunky also prepared to go with them. At that time, about 500 Brahmins from various other places were visiting Upasada. When they heard that Chunky was going to call on recluse Gautama, they went to him and requested him not to go to Gautama. They tried to convince him that such a thing would undermine his prestige. But Chunky didn't listen to them. He told them it was proper and fitting that he goes to recluse Gautama. Chunky went to the Tathagata with a big retinue of Brahmins. After greeting them, he sat to one side. At that time, the Buddha was discussing Dhamma with elderly Brahmins. A 16-year-old Brahmin named Kapatikka was also present in the assembly. He had studied three Vedas. He kept interrupting the discussion that the elders were having. The Tathagata told him not to do so and to wait till they had finished discussion. Then Chunky told the Buddha, let not recluse Gautama stop Kapatikka Brahmin. He is high-born, erudite and a scholar. He speaks sage words. He is capable of having an argument with you. Then the Buddha thought that perhaps Kapatikka wants to talk about the three Vedas and therefore the Brahmins are promoting him. Kapatikka decided in his mind that he would ask a question when recluse Gautama turned his attention to him. The Buddha understood what was in Kapatikka's mind and turned to him. Kapatikka said, Sir Gautama, the Vedas are the scriptures of Brahmins that have come from ancient times and they have firm faith that this is the only truth, all else is false. To this the Buddha replied, In this assembly, is there a single Brahmin who can say that I know this? I understand this. This is the only truth. All else is false. The assembly answered in the negative. The Buddha further questioned, Did even the Brahmins of ancient times speak from their own experience? Again the assembly answered in negative. Then the Buddha said that it was like a line of Brahmins in which those ahead don't see, those in the middle don't see, and those in the back don't see. Thus the faith of Brahmins and Vedas is without foundation. Kapatika responded, They don't say this is based on faith, but based on tradition. The Buddha then pointed out the contradiction in his assertion that earlier Kapatika talked about faith and now he talked about tradition. Then the Buddha explained to him the two consequences of faith. Even if one has high faith in something, that thing can be hollow, low and false. On the other hand, if one doesn't have faith in something, it can be real, truthful and objective. Similarly, there can be two consequences for inclination, tradition, reasoning and contemplation. Then he said to Kapatikka, Friend, a wise man who wants to protect truth should not hold extreme views such as This is the only truth and all else is false. 
In response to the question as how to abide in truth, he explained, When someone has faith, he should not hold the extreme view that this is the only truth and all else is false. He explained similarly about inclination, tradition, reasoning and contemplation. The Buddha explained that though this extreme view helps in protecting the truth, it doesn't help in understanding the truth. When he was asked as how to understand the truth, he answered, When a bhikkhu lives in a town or a city, a layman goes to him and checks him for craving, aversion and ignorance. He checks whether the bhikkhu out of greed says that he understands something when he doesn't. Whether the bhikkhu out of greed says that he has seen something when he hasn't and whether he gives sermons that bring harm and suffering to people. When the layman finds that the bhikkhu does no such thing and that he is without greed in mind, speech and action, he also tests him for aversion and ignorance. When the bhikkhu passes the tests, the layman develops faith in him. The layman then attends on the bhikkhu, listens to his teaching and behaves according to his teaching, investigates things that he has put into action. Such things then become suitable for meditative absorption. This creates inclination in him. Due to inclination, he develops one after the other, enthusiasm, advancement, courage, and then he experiences the ultimate truth in this very body. With his wisdom, he penetrates to the deepest truth. Thus, he understands the truth. Then he said, One attains truth when one practices, cultivates and abundantly develops these same qualities as explained above. When asked what leads to abundant development, the Buddha said, It was due to effort. Effort increases due to advancement, advancement due to enthusiasm, enthusiasm due to inclination, inclination due to contemplation, contemplation due to investigation, investigation of meaning due to righteous conduct, righteous conduct due to listening to Dhamma, listening to Dhamma due to attentiveness, Attentiveness due to attending on the bhikkhu, attending on the bhikkhu due to associating with him, and association due to faith. Kapatika was satisfied after listening to the Buddha's explanation. He said to the Buddha, Gautama, in the past we used to think, how can these lowly, dark, created from the feet of Brahma, shaven headed ascetics, samanas, have any understanding of Dhamma. But today, Gautama, you have inspired in my mind affection, joy and respect for Sammanas. And he requested the Tathagata to accept him as a disciple. Other Brahmins opposed Chanki when he decided to call on the Buddha. We see such instances elsewhere too in Tipitak. This had its root in the belief of superiority of Brahmins. For a Brahmin to call on a non-Brahmin was disgraceful, not only for that Brahmin, but also for the entire caste it was felt. Therefore, they tried to curtail the individual freedom of a Brahmin for the prestige of the caste. Here, Chanki's conduct is questionable. Chanki must be commended for not giving in to pressure by the other Brahmins and for explaining to them why it is he who should go to the Buddha and not the other way round. We should, however, examine his conduct. When Kapatika was interfering again and again in the conversation that the Buddha was having with elders, Chanki stood up for him, and though the Buddha had politely asked Kapatika not to interfere, he asked the Buddha to let Kapatika speak. His motive doesn't seem entirely pure. One possibility is that he had received a town and gift from King Pasenadi. Thus he was enjoying material comforts due to royal patronage. He knew that the king, whose handouts he was enjoying, was a devoted disciple of the Buddha. It is possible that this played a part in Chanki's decision to call on the Buddha. It is not a pleasant thought that Chanki had this ulterior motive. 
but had he allowed Kapatikka to wait as per the Buddha's request, his conduct would have been blameless. It was a clever move to promote Kapatikka. When the 16-year-old Kapatikka was interfering in the Buddha's discussion, he doesn't seem to be doing so out of his own initiative. The Tathagata rightly guessed that he was promoted and incited by the Brahmins. The move was planned by the elderly Brahmins. If Sammana Gautama couldn't answer a teenage boy, it would certainly be humiliating for him. On the other hand, if he does win the argument, it would be against a teenage boy and thus there would be no blot on the superiority of the Brahmins or undue gain in prestige of Gautama. This was probably the thinking behind the move. The scholarship of the Brahmins was based on Vedas. They would corner others by asking questions about the Vedas. Kapatika forcefully put forth the faith they had in Vedas. This theory that the Vedas are all that is true and all else is false has hindered scientific progress and obstructed its flow. Many scholars from Vedic tradition claim Vedas is the last word. A pet principle of the Vedic is that the human intellect cannot examine the Vedas. Kapatika was voicing this opinion of the Vedic tradition. A humble faith can protect oneself. When the Tathagata asked the assembly if they talk from their own experience, it is clear that he considers experience greater than faith. Once he explains this, Kapatika turns to tradition. Any neutral reasonable man would agree that the Tathagata's explanation regarding faith, tradition and other things was correct. No one can challenge his assertion that something that we have faith in may turn out to be false and something that we don't have faith in may turn out to be true. He also implied that the faith can indeed be true. One should state this is my faith, not arrogantly, but with humility. This stand doesn't compromise truth, but expresses one's understanding of truth. It can be true, it can be false. As long as one doesn't become adamant and inflexible about his faith, one is a wayfarer on the path of truth. From protecting the truth, to understanding the truth, to attaining the truth, the various stages that the Tathagata explain tell us about the hard work that is needed on the path of acquisition of knowledge and wisdom. The Tathagata's stand on Vedas is reasonable. Whether he knew a particular verse in Vedas and whether he knew the meaning of that verse is irrelevant. It is clear from the Tathagata's interaction with Kapatikka that he opposed both the Vedas and the Vedic tradition. One doesn't need knowledge of Vedas or Sanskrit to decide whether one should chart one's own path to the truth using discretion and experience or to depend totally and blindly on the Vedas. At no point in the Tipitak or any other literature is there any direct or indirect accusation against the Tathagata that he didn't know either Vedas or Sanskrit. In fact, there are suttas where the Tathagata talks about the various sages of Vedic tradition and also tells Brahmins the good qualities about their own tradition. The issue here is one of principle. It is not necessary that a person knows a particular language to take a stand on epistemological issue, on issues related to how to acquire knowledge. One who takes a stand about scientific approach to knowledge based on experience doesn't need to know all the languages of the world and doesn't have to read all the literature in the world. I am not saying that the Tathagata had no knowledge of the Vedas or the Vedic tradition. He had enough knowledge of the Vedas and the Vedic tradition to hold his own in discussions with erudite Brahmins of the Vedic tradition. It is a tragedy that some scholars, as noted above, of the Vedic tradition have no awareness that there could be higher knowledge outside of Sanskrit literature and Vedas. At the end of his discussion, 
Kapatikal liberated himself without any hesitation from the yoke of Brahminism and declared that he was satisfied. He also added openly how earlier he used to look upon Samanas with disdain. He rid himself of false conceit that no one other than Brahmins can know Dhamma or have the capacity to understand Dhamma. We will now talk about Tevijja Brahmins and the path to the Brahma that they have not seen. Tevijja means knowers of threefold knowledge. Rigveda, Yajurveda and Samaveda are all called threefold knowledge Trividya. The Stevijja are masters of the three Vedas. Tevijja Sutta of the Long Discourses contains a discussion of the Buddha with the Tevijja Brahmins to examine their knowledge. There was a town named Manasakatta in Kosala. Once the Tathagata was dwelling with many bhikkhus in a mango grove on the bank of the Achiravati river to the north of the town. At that time, there were many Brahmins in Manasakatta who were wealthy and who had gained name and fame for their erudition. These included Chanki, Todeya, Pokharasati, Janusoni, Tarukha, among many others. Once two Brahmins named Vasetha and Bharadwaja started a discussion while they were taking a leisurely walk. They were talking about a path leading to the Brahma realm. Vasetha informed Bharadwaja that Pokharasati had told him that such a such path would take a person directly to the Brahma realm if he were to commit a particular deed. Bharadwaja said that Tarukha had made exactly the same claim to him about another path. Both were not able to convince the other. Then Vasetha suggested that they go to recluse Gautama. He enumerated various epithets that were used for the Buddha to tell Bharadwaja about his superlative reputation. He said that he would accept whatever Gautama would say about their argument. Bharadwaja agreed. Then both of them went to the Buddha and after proper salutations, sat down on one side. Addressing the Buddha, Vasetha told him about their argument. The Buddha repeated what Vasetha had said to make sure that he understood it clearly. He also asked specifically about their differences and disparities in their views. Then Vasetha put forth his view that, though the opinions of various texts differed, they all lead to the Brahma realm, just as a town with several approach roads. Thrice the Buddha asked him, You say lead to Brahma realm, and thrice Vasetha answered in the affirmative. Thus having again confirmed his stand, the Tathagata asked him, Is there anyone among the Tevijja Brahmins? who has seen the Brahma with his own eyes? Vasetha answered in negative. Then the Tathagata asked him whether any one of the teachers or the teacher's teachers or any one of the past seven generations had seen Brahma with his own eyes. Again Vasetha answered in the negative. Then he said to Vasetha, Ancient sages, composers of Vedic verses, were the ancestors of the Tevijja Brahmins. Tevijjas of today repeat the chants that were chanted by these ancestors. They chant what the ancestors chanted. They claim what the ancestors claimed. Vasetha, do even these ancestors claim to have seen the Brahma, whom he lives with and where he stays? Vasetha again said no. Then the Tathagata pointed out the disparities in the claims of Vasetha. None of those associated with the Tevijjas claim to have seen the Brahma or have gone to the Brahma realm. And even then, they all claim to know the direct path to the Brahma realm. They claim to show the path that they have not seen and not known. Indicating the inconsistency, the Tathagata asked him, Vasetha? In this situation, don't you agree that the claims of the Tevijjas are dishonest? Vasetha accepted that the claims were truly dishonest. After this discussion, 
The Buddha gave many examples to point out the discrepancy in Tevijja's claims. It is like a chain of blind men. Those in the front don't see, those in the middle didn't see, and those in the back didn't see. Tevijja's claim of the path to the Brahma realm was similarly hollow and baseless. The Buddha said, Tevijja Brahmins worship the sun and the moon, praise and salute them with folded hands and turn around in circle. Do the Tevijjas see the sun and the moon? Vasitha said, yes. Can the Tevijjas show the path to the sun and the moon? The Buddha asked. Vasitha said, no. The Buddha responded, Tevijjas cannot show the path to the sun and the moon that they see with their own eyes. Then isn't it unfair claim that they can show the path to the Brahma realm when none of them or anyone associated with them has seen the Brahma? Vasitha agreed that it was an unfair claim. The Buddha then turned to another example. A man claims to seek a beautiful courtesan. When asked whether he knows the identity, the family or the clan of the courtesan, he says no. When asked whether she is tall or short or medium height, he says he doesn't know. When asked if she is dark or fair, he says he doesn't know. When asked whether she lives, he says he doesn't know. To the question, do you seek and desire the beautiful woman about whom you know nothing? He answers yes. Vasetha agreed that the claim of the Tevijjas is as baseless as that of the man who seeks the beautiful woman he knows nothing about. On a highway, a man constructs a great staircase to ascend to a palace. On asking whether he knows where the palace is, how tall it is, he says he doesn't know. But to the question whether he is constructing a staircase to the palace, he says, yes. Again, Vasetha agreed that just like this man, the claim of the Tevijjas is baseless. The river Achiravati has a flood and is flowing full to the brim. Even a crow sitting on the bank can easily drink water from it. Then a man who desires to cross over to the other side of the river stands on this side and prays hard. O oh, yonder shore, please come to this side. He requests and pleads and prays. The Buddha asks, Vasetha, will the yonder shore come to this shore due to such requests, pleadings and prayers? Vasetha said no. Then the Buddha said, Just like this man, if the Brahmins don't reject the path of vice and don't accept the path of virtue, it is not possible that the prayers to the gods will take the Tevijjas to the realm of Brahma after their deaths. If the river Achiravati is flooded, flowing full to the brim, and a man wished to cross it, then while he is sitting on this side of the river, if someone ties his hands behind with a strong chain, will he be able to cross over to the other shore while thus shackled? Vasetha answers, no. Then the Buddha compared this man with the Tevijja Brahmins. In the noble discipline of the Buddha Dhamma, the five sensual pleasures enjoyed through the contact of their subjects with the eye, ear, tongue, nose and skin are called the shackles. The Tathagata then told Vasetha that if the Tevijja Brahmins are thus enthralled by sensual pleasures, there is no possibility of them going to the Brahma realm. The Buddha asked, Will a man lying with his face covered by a blanket on the bank of the river Achiravati that is flowing full to the brim, be able to cross to the other bank? Vasetha replied in negative. Then the Buddha compared this man with the Tevijja Brahmins. In the noble discipline of the Buddha Dhamma, the five hindrances are like blanket covering the face. The five hindrances or blankets are craving for sensual pleasures, aversion, sloth and torpor, agitation and regret, and doubt. If the Tevijjas are covered by these blankets, they will not be able to go to the Brahma realm. The Buddha asked, When the Tevijjas describe the Brahma, do they describe him as covetous, vile, 
hateful, tainted and undisciplined or non-covetous, full of goodwill. Vasetta answered, non-covetous, with goodwill, without hatred, pure and disciplined. Then the Buddha asked, Vasetta, are the Tevijjas covetous or non-covetous? Vasetta answered that the Tevijjas are covetous and agreed that they can't be one with the Brahma who is non-covetous. The Tathagata said, The Tevijjas have lost their way. They have gone astray. They are swimming where there is no water. Therefore, it can be said that their knowledge of the three Vedas is barren. Then Vasetta replied, I have heard that Sammana Gautama knows the way to the Brahma realm. Then the Buddha asked him, Is Manasakata close by or far away? Close by, Vasetta said. Will a man born and raised in Manasakata take a long time to show the way to Manasakata? No, said Vasetta. Similarly, it won't take long for the Tathagata to show the way to the Brahma realm. Then Vasetta requested him to show the way to the Brahma realm for the welfare of the Brahmins. The Buddha asked him to listen attentively and gave a description of the virtues present in the Buddha, especially the four qualities of goodwill, compassion, sympathetic joy and equanimity that lead to a mind free of any enmity. Then he asked Vasetta whether a bhikkhu possessed of such qualities was covetous or non-covetous. Vasetta answered non-covetous and agreed to the Buddha's assertion that a non-covetous bhikkhu will go to the Brahma realm who is non-covetous. Finally, Vasetta and Bharadwaja requested the Buddha to accept them as his disciples. We will now analyze the above discussion. When Vasetta and Bharadwaja go to the Buddha to seek his opinion, the Buddha repeats what Vasetta had asked him. Through repeated questioning, he understands the exact nature of their doubt. This is not a minor detail in narration, but a very significant aspect of the process of acquisition of knowledge and wisdom. We often see that some people don't fully listen to what is being said or don't read carefully what is being stated. They start making statements based on partial hearing or reading, which creates confusion. The habit of the Tathagata to first understand carefully what is being stated makes the discussion disciplined. The Buddha's Vasetta several questions that lead to Vasetta accepting that the Tevijjas had not seen Brahma while they claimed to show the path to his realm. The Tathagata gave importance to one's own experience. He cautioned against flights of fancy. His questions to Vasetta followed the rational process of scientific inquiry. To show the discrepancy in the claim of the Tevijjas, the Tathagata used several parables. All these parables are very effective. They are different from each other and not mere repetitions of the same parable. Believing something that has come down from generations without any basis in experience, he compares it to a line of blind men. The parable of the sun and the moon shows how if Tevijjas cannot show the way to something that can be seen, they cannot show the way to something which they have no knowledge about. The courtesan parable shows how the desire to attain something that someone has no knowledge about is useless. The parable of the staircase to the palace goes a step further and shows that striving for something one has no knowledge about is futile. The parable of the prayer to the far shore is different from the above. One may have high aim, a great goal, but if one merely prays to the gods for the goal to be fulfilled, it is futile. One has to make efforts in the form of an upright conduct to get there. Another and subtler aspect of the same principle is brought to light in the parable of the man in chains. Just as prayers won't be effective, efforts will lead nowhere if one is shackled by sensual pleasures. Similar is the case of a man who is obstructed by the five hindrances of mental defilements. 
if the brahma realm is really considered to be the symbol of highest achievement then it cannot be attained by one who is covetous and hateful it can be achieved only by one who has removed all enmity from the mind through the practice of goodwill compassion and other good qualities whether to call the brahma realm as the highest goal or not is not relevant here what is relevant is that this high goal cannot be achieved with a mind that is defiled but can only be attained by a mind that is free of mental impurities the tathagata explained that the highest goal of human life could not be achieved by tevijjas through various prayers and rituals unless their mental impurities are eradicated we can say that the tathagata stand was based on modern parameters of enquiry This shows that the criticism by Marathi Nyanakosh that the Buddha spoke out of spite for the Brahmins is itself indicative of their prejudice against the Buddha. We will now discuss several aspects of Buddha's demeanor. These highlight the qualities stated earlier, especially equanimity and compassion. First, The Tathagata did not get upset by criticism. The Brahmachala Sutta of long discourses throws light on the Buddha's wisdom. Once the Buddha was travelling with a retinue of 500 bhikkhus on the road between Rajgir and Nalanda. At that time an ascetic named Supiya was walking on the same road behind the Sangha with his disciple Brahmadatta. Supiya was criticizing the Buddha Dhamma and Sangha in various ways and Brahmadatta was praising the triple gem in various ways. The Buddha and his Sangha stopped at a grove named Ambalatikka to rest for the night. Supi and Brahmadatta also stopped there for the night. In the night the argument between them continued in the same vein. When the night was over The bhikkhu started discussing the conversation they had overheard between the two. Then the Tathagata asked them what they were talking about. The bhikkhu told him about Supiya's criticism. The Tathagata said, "Bhikkhus, if someone criticizes me or the Dhamma or the Sangha, you should not become angry or dejected. Doing this will harm you." Bhikkhus If someone criticizes me or the dhamma or the sangha will you become angry or dejected will you harm yourself thus by becoming angry or dejected will you examine whether their criticism has any truth in it or not the bhikkhu said that they will not get angry and harm themselves the buddha continued bhikkhus when someone criticizes you you should find out if there is any truth in the accusation the criticism should be examined and one should look inside to see if it is applicable to one because if someone praises me or the dhamma or the sangha you should not become happy delighted and joyous if you do so you may harm yourself when someone praises one one should examine it to see if there is any truth in it find out the reality you should look at yourself to see if the praise is based on reality it is critical to comprehend that criticism is an opportunity for introspection this incident shows how the tathagata was able to look at himself objectively and to evaluate himself objectively he was emphatic that the bhikkhu should examine blame and praise without bias This shows that he was honest about opening himself to examination. In practice, we often lose balance in the face of criticism. We become angry. If someone criticizes the critic, we feel good. Some consider people as enemies, not only those who disparage them, but also those who make factual critical comments. They even become violent in response to criticism. This includes not only lay people but also those who claim to be saints and spiritual teachers. They are intolerant and yet preach tolerance. The Buddha looked at criticism constructively. 
he considered criticism as an opportunity to look at oneself and to correct oneself if needed. He didn't want his followers to blindly believe him to be perfect. He wanted them to investigate and then accept or reject something on merit. Matri Cheta describes this aspect of the Buddha thus, You are a benevolent friend of those who wish to harm you. You try to find good qualities in those who constantly seek to find faults in you. In response to poisonous and scorching invitations, you go with compassion and cool of the deathless. On the other hand, don't get carried away by praise. What is true of censure is also true of praise. Rather than getting elated by praise, he wanted us to check whether the praise is based on reality. He himself followed the path of truth. And he taught his followers to get as close to the truth as possible in the journey of life. He showed with his own example that one who wants to investigate truth should not be afraid to apply stringent criteria to oneself. The incident narrated above was one of many of its kind where the Buddha invites unbiased examination. Among the incidents that show a humble objectivity of looking at criticism was an integral part of his personality. Sampadaniya Sutta in the Long Discourses describes one such episode. Sampadaniya means faith that satisfies. Once the Tathagata was dwelling in the Pavarika mango grove near Nalanda, then Venerable Sariputta saluted him and sat down to one side. He declared, Venerable Sir, I am happy because there has never been, there is none, and there will be no ascetic or holy man who is superior to the Tathagata in the field of enlightenment. On listening to Sariputta, the Buddha commented, Sariputta, your words are grand and bold. You have roared a lion's roar. Sariputta, have you with your own mind known the morality, wisdom, conduct and liberation of the Sambuddhas of the past? Sariputta answered no. Then the Tathagata asked him the same question about the present and future Sambuddhas. Sariputta again answered no. Then the Buddha said, Sariputta, how can you make such a bold statement though you don't know with your own mind the past, the present and the future Buddhas? Then Sariputta enumerated several qualities of the Buddha. He sought and got Buddha's agreement that this assessment was objective. Then Udai, who was present there, exclaimed, Venerable Sir, it is a surprise. The Tathagata's non-greed, contentment and purity of mind are miraculous. He doesn't show himself off, though he has so much ability and great experience. If someone else had even one of the qualities, he would have continuously advertised himself. Sariputta seconded Udai's assertion. Then the Tathagata asked Sariputta to give a Dhamma talk that will remove the doubts about the Buddha. Thus Sariputta expressed his happiness about the Tathagata. Therefore, it is called the faith that satisfies. Just as the Buddha questioned the bhikkhus who were upset with the criticism from Supiya, he also quizzed Sariputta over the praise Sariputta heaped on him. He was untouched by praise and censure. If a common man cultivates even a fraction of this quality, he or she would live a far more balanced life. Udai's assertion of his character is also significant. In spite of his great erudition, the Buddha didn't advertise it or was conceited about it. On the other hand, he also didn't show false humility and deny his knowledge. The Buddha successfully maintained that fine balance. He was objective about his great knowledge and distributed wisdom freely and openly for 45 years. Just as a bud blossoms into a flower ever so imperceptibly, even today, his eternal teaching leads to blossoming of the heart of millions of people and become fragrant with wisdom. Another attribute of the Buddha was his flexibility. 
the buddha was not adamant or rigid he was willing to make changes in his stance if he found that a decision taken under certain circumstances was not applicable in other circumstances he was willing to change it he had done this on several occasions this flexibility is seen in tikni patha of the graded discourses once the buddha was dwelling in vulture park near rajgir at that time an ascetic named sarabha had just left the sangha in an assembly in rajgir he claimed that he had left the dhamma and discipline of the buddha after knowing it well some bhikkhus reported this to the buddha at that time sarabha was staying on bank of sipinika river on the request of the bhikkhus the tathagata went to meet sarabha he asked sarabha whether he had indeed said what he had heard sarabha kept quiet again the buddha asked him the same question and again sarabha kept quiet then the buddha asked him tell me sarabha have you understood the dhamma of the sakyan sammanas if there is deficiency in what you say i will clarify if what you say is correct and indeed there is a lacuna in the teaching i will accept thrice the buddha asked the question and thrice sarabha kept quiet other ascetic also requested sarabha to speak up but he sat there quiet with his head hanging if sarabha had misunderstood his teaching the buddha was willing to clarify the teaching and remove his misunderstanding on the other hand if sarabha had valid objection to the teaching the tathagata was willing to concede it this means that the tathagata was open to correction if there was a valid suggestion sarabha however did not open his mouth this is what happens often some people indulge in backbiting spread rumors lie and create wrong impression in the minds of people but these same people when confronted and asked to give evidence for their statements don't do so when confronted in person they keep quiet or run away sarabha was one such person more important here is the tathagata's humility openness and flexibility some people stick to their false opinions out of egotism even though they realize that their position is untenable when this happens in the field of knowledge it harms the progress of human society it is yet another big gift of the buddha to the field of knowledge that he didn't allow such egotism to develop in his case an opinion if it is called scientific should always be open to correction when an authentic contrary evidence comes to light the buddha was skilled in explaining this view to others and to convince them however he never misused his skill to encroach on the freedom of others in this regard his discussion with vappa is illuminating the tathagata told vappa if you find what i say acceptable second it if you find it objectionable object to it and if you don't understand what i say ask me and i will clarify it we will now talk about the buddha's last sermon from the time of his enlightenment the buddha traveled incessantly to spread dhamma for the welfare of the people he kept this commitment till the end of his life how steadfast he was in his commitment can be seen in the following incident from his life given in mahaparinibbana sutta in the long discourses at that time an ascetic named subhadra was living in kusinara he heard that the buddha is going to breathe his last that night he had heard that it was rare for a buddha to arise he thought that he would ask guidance from the buddha in person and met ananda to express his wish ananda told him that the tathagata is tired do not trouble him twice subhadra made the request twice ananda declined subhadra requested for the third time and again ananda refused the tathagata heard their conversation he called ananda over and instructed him 
do not stop subhadra whatever he asks will be for the sake of knowledge and not with the intention to trouble me he will quickly grasp whatever explanation i give him so ananda allowed subhadra to meet the buddha subhadra approached the buddha and sat down to one side after salutations he then asked the buddha questions about the knowledge of the other teachers of that time but the buddha advised him to keep this topic aside and told him to be attentive as he was going to teach dhamma to him he taught subhadra the noble eightfold path subhadra was satisfied he requested to be accepted in the sangha the buddha told him that the ascetics from other traditions had to wait for 4 months before admission to the sangha subhadra replied that he was willing to wait for 4 years seeing his earnest wish the buddha asked ananda to prepare for subhadra's ordination subhadra was gratified to receive ordination at the hand of the buddha he turned out to be the last disciple to receive teaching from the buddha himself later he became an arhat after explaining dhamma to subhadra the tathagata called ananda and told him ananda it is possible that when i am no more you will feel that now you are without your teacher but ananda you should not think thus i have taught dhamma and discipline in my absence this dhamma and discipline will be your teacher afterwards he called the bhikkhus and asked them bhikkhus if anyone has doubts or questions about the buddha dhamma or sangha feel free to ask you should not later regret that i had some question and i didn't ask the buddha when i had the opportunity the bhikkhus were silent for the second time for the third time the buddha asked the same question and each time the bhikkhus remained silent then the buddha suggested to them if anyone is quiet out of respect to the teacher let him tell another bhikkhu and let that bhikkhu then ask the question to me the bhikkhus continued to be quiet ananda expressed satisfaction that they had no doubts in his last moments the sangha in front of him didn't have any doubts he said that even the most junior among the bhikkhus was a stream enterer and on the way of liberation thus he knew that none of them had any doubts lastly the tathagata said to the bhikkhus look bhikkhus i am exhorting you all compounded things are impermanent don't be heedless and achieve the goal these were the last words of the tathagata the final episode of his life shows us just how his life was complete the end was equally superior this was reassuring and comforting many of us often talk about commitment to do something all through the life to the end of life often this is just a poetic imagination most of it is an exaggeration and only a small fraction is real even then such pledges inspire us to work consistently towards a desirable goal when we look at the tathagata's last days we see that he literally followed his declaration of working for the welfare of many for the happiness of many bahujan hitai bahujan sukhai till his last breath he used the last moments of his life for the welfare of the people it may be difficult to fully comprehend the greatness of such men but we can certainly make an effort to walk on the path showed by him to the best of our ability the last episode of his life has four elements sermon to subhadra telling ananda that dhamma and the discipline are guide in his absence encouraging the bhikkhus to speak out if they had any questions or doubts and his last advice to keep striving of those four elements we will take up elsewhere the subject of dhamma and the discipline being the guide in his absence here we will discuss the other three subhadra had an honest quest for knowledge he had met the tathagata prior to this on finding out that the tathagata didn't have long to live he felt it was an opportunity not to be missed 
the urge took him to the Tathagata. On reaching the spot, he expressed his ardent wish to Ananda and in spite of Ananda's refusals, kept requesting him repeatedly. Both were right in their own place. Subhadra had but one opportunity to hear the Dhamma from the Buddha himself. He wanted to quench his thirst for knowledge. On the other hand, Ananda too was right. He knew the Tathagata's physical condition. The Tathagata was tired. Ananda had spent several years in his company. He knew that the Tathagata needed to rest in those final moments after a lifetime of hardships in the service of the people. He conveyed this to Subhadra. His intention was not to deprive Subhadra of Dhamma, but to only allow the Tathagata a much-needed rest. There was neither arrogance nor pettiness of misuse of his position in Ananda. Both Subhadra and Ananda were right in their own place. Even during the last moments, the mental faculties of the Buddha were fresh as ever. We have seen in the foreword what Swami Vivekanand said about the Buddha's compassion. The Buddha knew that Subhadra was an honest seeker. In his life, he had met many people who had come to him not to seek guidance, but to test him, to harass him, to insult him. Even to those people, he had not denied a meeting. He wouldn't do so for Subhadra. He was always prompt and energetic in helping those who came to him to seek guidance. We should understand that it was not to demean Ananda or to change his decision in a negative way. He trusted Ananda and Ananda was happy to comply when the Tathagata felt otherwise about his decisions. Ananda was mature enough to understand his dedicated commitment to a lifelong mission. The Buddha circumvented the questions about the other teachers of those times. It was not because he didn't want to give his opinion with reasons on the teaching of these teachers. He surely had done that in the past. When one is proclaiming the truth to the world, it is essential to tell the world what is not truth and to point deficiencies in the arguments of those who say otherwise. This, however, was a different situation. He had very little time left. After talking to Subhadra, he also wanted to address the bhikkhus. Thus, he had to have an efficient plan to teach Subhadra in a short time. Generally, any sermon has two parts. One part is to contest falsehoods or harmful misconceptions. The other part is positive aspect in which one gives truthful and beneficial teaching. This aspect conveys the essence of one's position. When the time is short, one often has to forego the first aspect of contesting the falsehood and focus on the essence of one's message. The Tathagata did exactly this. He focused on the Noble Eightfold Path and guided Subhadra in the right direction. The sermon to Subhadra offered no material gain or physical comfort to an extremely tired and ailing Tathagata. It was actually a physically taxing endeavor. The exhaustion, if anything, would perhaps shorten the life by a few moments. This is one way of looking at it. It is quite likely that the joy of helping Subhadra gave him comfort and extended his life by a few moments and he used that time to address the bhikkhus. After comforting Ananda that the Dhamma and the discipline are the guide in his absence, the Buddha addressed the bhikkhus. This is a touching moment. He was literally minutes away from his last breath. He wanted to use this time to clarify any doubts that the bhikkhus might have. His compassion at that juncture was equal to what he had felt while tirelessly wondering when he was much younger and physically strong. We will see later how he had courteously explained to Lohitcha Brahmin who held the view that one should not share one's knowledge. Tukaram's words of compassion in helping people apply to the Buddha. People are wallowing in misery. Can't stand that sight. Compassion wells up within. That's why I help. 
repeatedly and in various ways. The Buddha encouraged the bhikkhus to ask if they had any doubts. This showed his infinite compassion as well as his scientific commitment to knowledge. He was full of love and affection when he told them to seek clarification for doubts, lest they regret later in life. Many times in one's life, even though there is doubt in one's mind, one doesn't build courage to ask questions. Lack of confidence, diffidence, belief that asking questions will be disrespectful to the person in whom one has faith. Undue humility are some of the reasons why people don't speak up and suppress the questions in their mind. Some teachers directly or indirectly discourage questions as they treat them as threats to their doctrine. The Tathagata knew this. Therefore, he showed a way out. A person who is not able to ask questions to the seniors often talks freely to one's colleagues or equals. A bhikkhu who may not have courage to address the Buddha may feel free in talking about the same matter with other bhikkhus. Therefore, the Buddha suggests that anyone who feels different about asking should tell someone else to ask the question. This shows his commitment in removing doubts, false beliefs and ignorance. On confirming that the bhikkhus had no doubts in their mind, he gave them his last exhortation. All his life he had explained the principle of impermanence. He reiterated it to impress its importance upon their mind. While stating that all compound things by their nature decay, he is on one hand repeating the fundamental quality of existence and on the other hand also preparing the bhikkhus to face his death with fortitude. His physical existence was an example of the principle of impermanence that is applicable to all compound things. This is the law of nature that is applicable to one and all, from a helpless pauper to an all-powerful emperor. It is applicable to someone who is enslaved by greed and ignorance, as well as to a fully enlightened one. The Tathagata faced death with total calmness, balanced mind and contentment. Today, after 25 centuries, his last words, strive tirelessly to achieve the goal, resonate with equal freshness and inspiration. An episode toward the end of his life in which he gave a guideline to Ananda shows how much the Buddha loved freedom. In the first synod, held after his great passing away, Venerable Ananda said to Venerable Mahakasapa, Venerable Sir, at the time of his passing away, the Tathagata told me, Ananda, if the Sangha feels necessary, they may do away with minor rules after my passing away. Mahakasapa asked him whether he had asked the Buddha which rules were to be considered minor. Then various bhikkhus started giving different opinions about which rules were minor and which were not. When Mahakasapa saw that there was no consensus on this, he took a decisive step. He declared, Rules of the discipline are known to lay people. They know what is proper and what is improper for the Buddha's bhikkhus. In this situation, if we cancel some rules, they will say, Sambhara Gautama's rules were like a suit of smoke. As long as the teacher was there, the bhikkhus followed it and now have stopped following them. To avoid this allegation, let us continue with all the rules. Venerable Mahakasapa got the assembly to agree to his view. Then he said to Venerable Ananda, Friend Ananda, you didn't ask the Tathagata which were the minor rules. This was wrong. You should seek the Sangha's pardon for this breach. Ananda responded only as Ananda would. I didn't do it deliberately. I don't think I have made a mistake. But out of respect to you, I will seek pardon. The bhikkhus also made some other allegations against Ananda. If we were to search for freedom of thought in history, this permission to do away with minor rules was a pinnacle, a high point of that freedom of thought. I would like to point out that had the Buddha specified which rules were minor, it would have again become the part of a rigid rule book. He didn't want to do it. 
He wanted the Sangha to decide whether with changing times, some rules were to be modified or changed. This will be clear if we look at the constitution of any modern nation. The Indian constitution, just like many others, gives future generations the right to amend it. If the makers of the constitution had specified that all the amendments that could be made, then it would have not allowed freedom to the future generations to decide independently and freely. And the right to amend the constitution would have become useless. This simple and yet monumentous statement of the Tathagata has three parts. First part is, if the Sangha feels. The second part is, minor rules. And the third is, the Sangha may cancel them. Situations change with time. Some things become outdated. Some new needs arise. Then the Sangha can initiate the process of change. One has to be careful that the changes are made without affecting the essence, the inner core. An amendment in the constitution of India changed the minimum age at which men and women can marry. But we can't remove the democratic principle from the constitution. If one does that, one destroys the very constitution itself. Similarly, bhikkhus are free to make decisions about food, medicines and other minor things. But if they do away with the Noble Eightfold Path, then it will destroy the whole teaching. The Buddha himself authorized the Sangha to cancel rules of discipline. It is not easy to bear the responsibility that comes with this freedom. Eric Fromm has explained in his book, Fear of Freedom, how and how much people fear freedom. Time, place and situation necessitate changes in lifestyle even for the bhikkhus. An upright bhikkhu may feel anguished and distressed if he finds it is very difficult or impossible to follow certain rules. If he breaks a rule due to a special situation, he will carry the guilt of having slipped. The Tathagata's advice to do away with minor rules, if the Sangha so feels, removes such unreasonable pressure and makes the bhikkhu free. If wisdom can't make a person free, if it doesn't impart confidence and courage to him, and if it doesn't end his dependence on others, then what is the use of that knowledge and wisdom? Can such knowledge be called real knowledge? The knowledge that the Tathagata proclaimed and taught was different. He felt that one who acquires knowledge should be grateful to the one who imparts it, but one should not develop a dependent attitude towards that person. He made countless people aware of their own wings of freedom so that they could fly freely and fearlessly in the sky of peace and happiness. He didn't make them insecure about their own abilities and didn't confine them to their nests.